Cosmica. C'è qualcuno là fuori? C'è qualcuno là fuori? Benvenuti al Christian Podcast. Il sesame è sobbato, ma non è tuo. Alright, my friends, how you guys doing in cyberspace today? Welcome to another show, a Christian podcast. My name is Beto Gudino, and I bring you weekly God Thinkers to talk about matters of culture and Christianity through the lens of emoji reactions that range from blasphemous to divine. And today's episode, we're going to talk about confronting power through activism. Are you guys ready? Well, we're going to talk about what does an activist do? And today we have Sandra Maria Van Opstal. She's a second generation Latina pastor, activist, author, and a powerful leading voice in the intersection of faith and justice. She is the founder and executive director of Chasing Justice. All right. Sandra, how are you doing? You go by Sandra or Maria or all together, Sandra Maria Van Opstal. Uh, Sandra's fine. Sandra's fine. <laughs> Perfect. Sandra, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Well, I'm doing well. I'm uh, trying to balance, you know, community, family, ministry, all the things. So today's a, a little bit of a storm, but I'm doing well. Awesome. Well, welcome to the show, and this is Christian Podcast. So this is what I'm going to do right now. This is a new thing I'm trying, but I have your book right here in my hands. Uh, I think you have other books, but the one I have in my hand says, Sandra Maria Van Opstal, 40 Days on Being an Eight. Uh, and it's about the Enneagram Daily Refractions, Reflections, and I think this this is kind of like a... a a part of a series of, of books on the Enneagram, right? And this one is, of course, on being an eight. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to react to it with an emoji. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Uh-oh. It's a reaction. Let's see. We're going to the emoji tombola right now. Emoji tombola. Reveal the emoji. That we're gonna give to Sandra right now. Okay. The emoji is a blasphemous emoji. Uh oh. <laughs> okay, Sandra, how do you feel about getting a blasphemous emoji reaction? Oh, I don't, I, I'm used to it. I'm used to that reaction. <laughs> awesome. Why is that? <laughs> um, I think because anytime you're trying to imagine a new way forward in understanding uh, Jesus and justice and faith, you're reforming, you're changing, you're reconstructing. There's going to be somebody that's not going to like it. So I'm used to it. I love it. And I kind of knew, I'm like, this is not the first time. This is not the first time. Sandra, this is going to be amazing first of all you know from latino to latina uh thank you for being on the show tell me a little bit about uh who you are and what you do just to get us started yeah so um well i'm uh, obviously i'm uh, i'm the daughter of two immigrants my mom's from colombia my father's from argentina and they met here in chicago fell in love the rest is history um and i always thought i was going to be a professional musician Um, mm. And so I studied, I have a degree in music business, an undergrad degree in music business. I have a master's um, in divinity. So I, I'm a pastor now. Um, and I think a lot, a lot, a lot of my career has centered at the intersection of worship and justice, faith and worship, and kind of what does it mean to be a person that is actively engaged in your community? So I think Yeah, I mean, all those parts of who I am, like growing up in the family I grew up in, understanding the world from their perspective, um, trying to figure out with what faith and um, social responsibility looked like. And so um, I am a pastor. I am an activist. I'm an author, um, a daughter, a mother of two little ones. So I do lots of things. But Awesome. Well, and all of the above, right? Um, I mean, it's... it's 
let's just start right here because when we hear the word activist, all kinds of things come to my mind, especially in the last couple of years. You know, there's all kinds of mental pictures. So can you, in your own words, what would be your definition when you say I'm an activist? Um, I, I think it means that I'm sh I'm present in the places that I live. You know, for me, being Ooh. an activist means that I am a neighbor. I understand what's happening in our in our community as far as housing, as far as equity, um, education, um, and that I speak to those things from my perspective. I think distinctly as a Latina Christian um, and someone who wants to see the world change. So I think activism. It means being involved and being socially engaged locally in the space where you in the in the place and space where you live, and then um, kind of connecting the dots to how the issues that you experience in your local space um, are impacted by statewide, citywide, national policy and practices. So that's what I mean by activist. So. In my community, we're dealing with housing, we're dealing with immigration, we're dealing with lots of those issues. So from the location that I'm in, I kind of follow the dots and see where um, where I'm called to make a difference mm. with my lifestyle and my activity. That's what I mean. Wow. And I mean, your community sounds just like my community. Where, where are you at? I'm on the west side of Chicago. So I okay. live in uh, Humboldt Park um, and I kind of neighbor and work um, west of there, like Humble Park to North Austin. So the church that I was previously previously pastoring in is located in North Austin. And it's a, it's a really creative, artistic, fantastic um, black and brown community that is financially disenfranchised. And um, we're trying to figure out how to connect the assets of the community to, to create a new, a new place, you know? Yeah. Love it. And, Uh, so when I when I hear, uh, for example, I think right here, let me see where I put it, oppressive systems, uh, what would you think? Because you talk a little bit of that in your, I mean, first of all, I kind of already jumped over the fact that in this book, you're talking about the Enneagram, and I think that's all uh, you know, amazing and being innate and what that means. Um, particularly, I, I'm not super sure, but I think my wife's an eight, and I can see a lot of her in what you were writing in this book, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna talk about things, even if people like it or not. And that's kind of my wife too. So yay for you know, everything that's on the book about the Enneagram. But a lot of what you talk about in the, in the book, it's, it's of course your experiences. And you talk a lot about, I mean, anything, right? You talk about even doing yoga and other things. But a lot of like the recurring theme is, um, this intersection of faith and justice and you you say um what's the word oppression systems of oppression so as you describe your community and it sounds an awful lot like the one i'm in i can't help but think okay what what do you mean when you say systems of oppression and is that something we're experiencing globally um i mean not just locally but is it global is it as a nation What do you think about, what are these systems of oppression? Yeah, well, I mean, systems of oppression have existed since humans have existed. So mm. um, what I mean by that is when when there is a person or, or typically a community or peoples that have power and they utilize that power um, for profit, for, for more power, for personal gain, and not for the flourishing and well-being of humanity. So I think there have always been systems of oppression, empires. I mean, even as we look at the scriptures, we know that the scriptures were written to people that were almost always the, the heroes and the character, the main characters in scripture were those people who were on the margins of power, Um, and they were living either in an oppressive, you know, Babylon or an oppressive uh, Roman Empire. So mm. they're not typically people that were in power. They're people that were immigrants, refugees, um, the economically disenfranchised, the religiously disenfranchised. So they, oppression has always existed since humanity has existed. Um, and for me, because I am writing as an Enneagram 8, the Enneagram 8, the kind of the relationship we have to the world, the way we see the world is – to challenge the things that are not made, that are not right, that we perceive that are not right. So on the heels, you know, we're here in January on the heels of uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday mm. um, and, and, and day. Um, 
Martin Luther King Jr. was an Enneagram 8. Mother Teresa was an Enneagram wow. 8. Um, che Guevara was an Enneagram 8. Wow. Fidel Castro, an Enneagram 8. You know, so whether it's like uh, lived out in, you know, almost floating spirituality like Mother Teresa or um, activism like Martin Luther King or revolution, um, Enneagram 8s just say the world's not right. This is not as it was meant to be and we need to do something about it. And um, and so that's kind of how I approach the world. You know, like I see things that aren't right. Like there is a reason why so many, let me give you an example. There's a reason why there's so many tutoring programs needed in urban centers across our country in the U.S. And that's not because mm. our our black and brown children are intellectually deficient. It's because our school systems are not running the same kind of, first of all, the same kind of educational caliber in our urban schools as as in our suburban schools. Secondly, our black and brown children are experiencing poverty and trauma, generational trauma. And, you know, when you're moving, for example, as an immigrant child from home to home and place to place, because you're not sure, you're never secure in your location. Those things mentally and intellectually and psychologically affect your ability to learn. Whether your stomach is full or not affects your ability to learn. So, um, there is there are systems, economic, historical systems that preferred and disenfranchised communities of people, and we're living in that right now. So I could say, well, you know, our tutoring program has 80 kids, our tutoring program has 100 kids, but the reality is there are tens of thousands of kids in our public school system that are not getting the social development they need, the academic development they need, or the counseling that they need for the levels of trauma that they've experienced. So that would be an example of one system mm. one okay <laughs> and how many more are there i mean uh as just at the top of your head what is wrong if you would say th that's one what's another two what's what are like the three top that you could name that you see in our society i mean i think for me as a as a person who my activism comes from my pastoring mm. so it comes from my proximity it's not like i picked topics oh. i wanted to care about I was living in this community and started seeing, for example, the housing disparity in our community. And as it gentrified and as people were willing to pay instead of $800, $1,800 a month for an apartment, um, what happens to the families that are making a minimum wage? And so mm. then I realized, okay, first of all, our minimum wages in this country are not livable. So we have to advocate for a livable wage. That's an issue of policy. That's an issue of, you know, what our, what our country um, tells uh, multi-million dollar national, uh, multinational companies they should be paying their workers. So how is it that a, that a, a mother or father is working three jobs, getting paid, I don't know, 10, 12 bucks an hour, um, never at home for their children because they have to be able to provide food for them and shelter Um, and then someone comes in and raises the rents. And so there's all these things around housing, livable wage, um, you know, status and immigration, they, they, they're, they blend in together. And so, um, the issues of the issues that I identify typically come just from the relationships I have, like, wait, it takes you how long to get to work? You have to take how many buses and how many trains? Like, so, so then I think to myself, how is it that people think, that people in my community don't want to work or that they're not hard workers. They actually, it takes them two hours to get to a minimum wage job that they have to work under really oppressive conditions sometimes in the factories that they work in and the locations they work in to, to commute two hours back to help their kids prepare for the next day of school. That's just the level of whether it's livable wage, issues of poverty, immigrant rights, worker rights, um, you know, how, how corporations treat their workers. Um, those are all things that end up on my desk basically, or in my head, because it started with a relationship and a conversation with someone that I love in my community. Wow. That makes, that makes a whole lot of sense. And like I was saying, I can identify with a lot. I'm, you know, I'm an immigrant and I'm of the undocumented kind. <laughs> uh, and I've been here 16 years And even yesterday, you know, we were doing another podcast with a friend in Spanish, but he travels the world and he was saying, uh, we were talking about what is, what does it mean to be a neighbor and like all these things. And, and I feel like, wow, uh, exactly what you're saying is what I was expressing to him. Like, I feel like my, my, my call is to those in proximity to me 
And the interesting thing is that the systems seems like they're they're so similar that even in a community like you're saying in Chicago, could be experiencing like almost the almost the exact same thing that people would experience here in Costa Mesa or in Santa Ana or you know in all these places. And the other thing is that as soon as you start talking about this, especially in America, and this is the only country that I've been in in the last 16 years other than Mexico, uh, but it starts getting politicized and then it starts getting labeled as communism. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've been called a Marxist or a communist. Like I told someone because a lot of my friends were writing books and being called names. And I was like, oh, 1996 was the first time someone called me a communist because I was teaching out of Luke chapter four. And I was like, I don't know how they got there. Um, I, I, I don't even know what these theories are they're presenting to me. I, I'm just trying to read scripture and be faithful to what I think is um, is said in there. And the reality is you can't, you can't, you cannot be a good neighbor without caring about the systems and the policies and the laws that crush the neck of your neighbor. If you can't, if, if you're trying to love someone and you see that there is, there is, um, you know, uh, a work a workplace that is endangering them, then you're going to say something. If you see something, a, a, a policing system that's endangering them, then you're going to say something. If you don't say something publicly, then what do you do? Just care for them and, you know, uh, bind up their wounds after they've been beat up? No, you have to care about those things to stop them. So to me, there is no way to be a good neighbor without being political because to be political means that you're engaged in the polis, in the community that you're in. Um, it absolutely matters to me if people have a livable wage. I don't want moms to be working three jobs. Yeah. You know, so, so yeah, so I get in trouble all the time. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, here's the interesting thing about capitalism and, and, the, and exactly what you're describing that, I mean, to me, and this is just me trying to you know, come up with terms that are simple so that anybody can understand, but the yeast of capitalism is work hard, earn a reward. And what these systems feel like you're in is like, I work as hard as I can and the, the, the situation's still the same and years pass and it's still the same. And that's where it, it almost feels out of your, like capitalism is I control it and this is the, the result. But there seems yeah. to be like there are forces outside of our control. Well, and the thing is, you, 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 if the system works for you, then it's not broken. It's actually doing exactly what it was designed to do. If, mm. if we have more, if, if black and brown folks are incarcerated at levels for the same crimes that are significantly more than white folks, then the system is working for the people who designed the system. Um, and so that's why, um, it feels overwhelming. I mean, it feels so overwhelming. But if you begin to break it down and say, well, what, what, what can I do? Like, what, it, what is it that I can do in my community? And you look at these amazing, like the abuelas and the tias and the, the neighbors in these, in these, um, in our communities, for example, in Chicago, doing like hunger strikes and speaking up and marching and getting the, the city council to change their minds on things that they thought they could get away with. Um, when it came to our tax dollars and, and equity in our school systems. And so I, I don't think you have to be an important kind of, you know, you know, credentialed, uh, formally educated person to make a difference in your community. I think mm. it is actually the grassroots folks that are making the difference in their community from walking guards to get their kids to school safety safely to the people that raise their voice at city council on issues of um, policing and safety in our neighborhoods to the folks that advocate at, in Springfield, which is our state capital in Illinois. So I think you take any issue um, that affects your community and we all have a role in it. And so for me, I'm just trying to help mobilize all of us to be a part of making a difference. And um, I think especially right now, because again, like in our, in our national in in our um, federal legislature right now, there's laws that are being passed on voting and states that are trying to pass laws on voting that are trying to disenfranchise black and brown voters from voting. So the very thing we need to have happening, um, a lot of times people of faith are silent because they feel overwhelmed. Um, 
And it's not that hard. You just pick up the phone, you call the person that you elected, and you say, hey, I want to make sure that everybody has the right to vote. So I don't like this, this policy that you're doing, you know. Um, we can all make a difference. Could it be that um, could it be that when we want to participate? So when no, you're you're talking about like all these topics that were super heated even the last couple of years, right? And throughout history, but uh, like policing and you know, immigration, <laughs> voting rights, like all this stuff. Um, what is the? I guess as a believer, because you you really do have this stance of like I'm a I'm a pastor I'm an activist so as a believer is there a fear like you're saying people are not voicing out you know, their where they should be speaking out for for their neighbor or whatever it is and is it maybe for a fear of I don't know if it's a fear of the I was going to say the unknown but I think it's it's a little bigger than that it's um uh i don't know what that fear is but what have you encountered as people as you invite people to participate what are like the main reactions for saying i don't want to do it yeah that's a good question i think people feel overwhelmed like oh my gosh you want me to you know change immigration policy i'm like yes did you know that our country has not changed its immigration policy since 1965 1965 that's when my parents came to this country and we have not had any comprehensive immigration reform. So they're like, you want me to do what? I'm like, yes, I just want you to come with me to meet with these people and say, Hey, I'm a Christian. And in my neighborhood, these are, my, these are the stories of the people in my neighborhood. And they're not, you know, murderers and criminals and rapists. They're just everyday normal people who are who have been in our country, who have been living here, who have been experiencing this, contributing to the flourishing of our neighborhood, um, you know, making sure you get all the food on your table you need. Um, these are the people that are here, and we just want a pathway to, to citizenship for them. We want a pathway to a green card for them. We don't want them to feel scared to have to pick up their kids after school or for the kids to wonder if their parents are going to show up. So would you come and tell those stories with me? And they do. I think they feel overwhelmed. I'm like, all I'm asking you to do is tell some stories. So I'll get the ladies from my community or the young people from my community. We'll go somewhere and we'll tell our stories. Like, hey, the kids in our after school program, the other day we heard them talking to each other and they were like, listen, if um, Chicago is a sanctuary city and if if uh, La Mira comes to your door, you know, you don't have to open it. You actually don't have to just if they knock and call, just don't open it. Just ignore it. They have no right to enter the house. Um, and they're all coaching each other. You want to know how old they were? Seven and eight years old. Wow. So the question is, how does the mental health of a seven now now at school they're not performing how they should perform, right? So the teachers are saying, you know, this person seems to be really disengaged in class. I'm like, do you know that their uncle is deported and now their mom and their dad are scared to go to work and all this stuff is happening and they're coaching each other on how to answer the door if immigration comes to your door. Um, is this the kind of conversations that wealthy white suburban seven and eight year olds are having with their peers? Then how can we say they've experienced, they, they should just, you know, kind of be at the same place. So I think it's, people feel overwhelmed. Like it's, how can I change the system? But, if, but again, if we look at the, the history of the civil rights movement, it wasn't one amazing, prophetic, intelligent Martin Luther King Jr. It was hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of neighbors showing up on buses and on bridges and mm. at the Capitol saying, in our neighborhood, this is not going to work for us. Um, and so I think if each of us saw ourselves as a part of a community of activists, um, we would we would feel a little bit um, maybe more motivated or more courageous to do those things. So I think overwhelmed is the first reason. And the second reason I think is because as Christians, I don't think that we have been taught a theology of neighboring that includes changing the system. I think mm. we, we have actually spent so much time talking about individual personal faith and your individual personal heart and your individual personal beliefs. 
that we lose what is in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, which is an invitation from Jesus to join a movement of wow. flourishing and a, a movement of change. Um, that invitation is always collective. And anytime the Holy Spirit comes down, there's a, there are households saved. And so it, it's not for you to have a personal moment with Jesus and just go off in your personal you know, space and have personal moments. It's for you to be invited to be a part of a family and a movement that changes the world so that as we as Christians live in our communities, we are pointing to a new heaven that is coming and a new earth that is coming, something different than the pain that we experience now. And I think if we had that theology, if from the pulpit we were preaching that, and if in our Bible studies it wasn't always about you, 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 then we would have a theology and a spirituality and a practice of neighboring. Wow. So what you're saying, what I'm getting is uh, there's the first one is people are overwhelmed. And the second one is individuality. And I would add a third one to this and it would be, no, some, I was trying to think, what is the fear that people have? And I think maybe one of mine from what I've witnessed through you know, reading about history, it's, it's violence, you know, and even as we think of Martin Luther, I think, you know, he, he, he was walking peacefully, right? Like, or, I mean, it was a movement of trying to bring peace, but at the same time, I think some people hijack uh, the end with different means and the means of violence. And I think that would be one of my, my fears, you know, especially when you talk about policing, Um, and I'm just being honest, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to lay it out and see um, how can we bring, you say, truth and justice, but in a way that also doesn't feel like I just want to have revenge or violence against this oppressive system, call it, you know, policing or call whatever it might be. Um, and in your book, you know, actually, I'm going to quote you right here. You say, uh, a Nate can do two of two things. Either give the middle finger to those in the church who don't feel are living up to our standards and disregard their humanity, or we can learn to speak truth to power in compassion and patience. So as I think of fear of violence, what do these words mean to you? Compassion and patience as speaking truth to power. Yeah, well... First of all, I, uh, yeah, so I think, um, well, I have so many thoughts going through my head right now. Excellent. Um, <laughs> I think that um, the, the, the issue that I see right now in the church is that some people want unity and want reconciliation and want peace without confronting powers or without repentance. So mm. I think that is the issue. The, the, the hardest thing for me is like, look, I'm trying, I'm, I'm being compassionate. Jeremiah was compassionate to God's people by telling the truth. If you guys do not turn and start following God, something is going to happen. Amos was compassionate by speaking truth and, and warning, you know, it's like the book of Amos starts with the Lord roars, the Lord roars. It's not like, oh, could you like, I just want to discuss with you the differences that we have. And you know, don't get too emotional. Don't get too emotional. Like I just, so you sound angry now. You sound, I don't want you to be angry. Well, of course I'm going to be angry. If I see the things I see in my neighborhood, I'm going to be angry and I should rightfully be angry. What I do with that emotion is important. So I don't think any, we tell this to our children because our children go through to therapy. It's like anger is not a bad emotion. It's not a bad emotion. And Jesus felt it and God feels it and the prophets felt it. It's how we respond in our anger that matters. And so um, I think we should, be, who should not be angry at small children, five to seven to eight years old being trafficked taken from their parents, moved to other places, sold to other places so that grown men could have sex with them. Who should not be angry at that? You don't think that makes God angry? That's evil. And so how should we not look back at our history in the United States of America and think that we put, we put people 
human beings on boats like cattle. We treat our we treat our grass fed cattle today better than we than, than our history treated than, than, than we treated both our Native uh, Americans as well as our African American brothers and sisters. How could we not look back at that and say even within our lifetime, people were treated less than human, and the church did nothing, and the church said nothing. And they just sang their songs and wrote their books and were supposed to read their theology as slaveholders as if they never treated people like property. That is evil. I don't know. Did they know God? I don't know. I'm reading them in seminary. I, who knows if they knew God or not? They knew about God. but I, and, and the fact that we challenge that is seen as inappropriate or is seen as wrong. I think that's called reformation. I think that's called spirit liberation, that we would say, actually, we should question whether someone is in Christ if they did those things, because by their fruit, we will know, not by their words, by their fruit, we will know. Oof. So I think that kind of anger, I think that is coming up from younger, I would say, especially emerging black, brown, white, every, I mean, all young leaders. I think that is so appropriate. I think it's like a fire that refines the church. And when we as pastors and community leaders and older theologians, when we don't listen to that, we mute the work of the Holy Spirit in this generation. If a fire is coming out from the belly of a generation saying, we cannot hear your words anymore because your deeds are so evil, then I think we ought to say, change us, God. Change us. And so I would be less interested in policing and in correcting how people express their anger. And I would be more interested in asking what is the Holy Spirit doing in here? Now, I do coach people. So I'm going to tell you all the time. I'm on the phone with leaders, activists, especially particularly Christian activists to tell them like, what do you think is the most effective way to do that? Like, I know you're right. Like, totally right. I would, you totally have the freedom to go in that space and, you know, with your words, just, you know, machine gun everyone. But do you really think that's going to work? Um, so I think one thing is a question of motivate motive. And the other thing is a question of execution. So I don't know how did Jesus, when I see the work of Christ in the scriptures, Jesus forcefully spoke to those in power, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, the Roman empire and the demons. He called those suckers out. So I think if you want me to be polite to a demon, if you want me to, if you want me to be polite to the spirit of racism in our country, I'm not going to be polite. And if you want to say that I have, I'm an unrepentant person who doesn't like white people, whatever. I, 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 I mean, I love white people. I just don't like white supremacy. So I'm going to call it out like a demon. Um, and so I think that's where we have to be um, more nuanced with one another to say, I hear your anger. I'm angry with you. I know it shouldn't be like this. How then shall we move together forward? How will we woo people to something new? Um, so I don't have an a answer that works for everyone, but I think the moment we find ourselves in is very, it's, I think it's sacred. I really do. Wow. Uh, super, super, super interesting. Because in a sense, you know, even when I, you know, we just, I don't know if we say celebrated, but no, Martin Luther yesterday, uh, King here in the U.S. And to me, it's just kind of weird that there's a Martin Luther King uh, in the U.S. and that 500 years ago, there was a Martin Luther and kind of he brought up the reformation of the church. And you know, we kind of know from history, you know, the Protestant church and this and that. But also the fact that it's... I feel like he was trying to reform and at the same time, some people turn into violence. And in a sense, I mean, my, my perspective is, I feel like that's not exactly what I want. That's not, that's not my goal, but it was almost a, almost inevitable. And nowadays when I, when I think of what's happening here, I'm like, wow. I mean, th I feel like that's what my, there, maybe it's my own fear, right? <laughs> but is this going to turn into violence? And I personally, I feel like I, I don't like violence. You know, I'm a person of peace. And even this podcast, I want to have conversations to bring about um, talk rather than fight, right? So I'd rather sit down with somebody and 
disagree. And that's why I have emojis because I feel like, okay, an emoji kind of like brings down the the barriers and the, you know, maybe the anger down a little bit. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like it gives opportunity to, okay, change my mind, you know, talk to me, have a conversation, tell me why you believe in the things you believe. And I guess, but uh, like you're saying, you know, who can stop this? And as you talk about the future, what would, what do you think is going to happen? Like, what is, well, what is your dream? You know, if, even we're talking about Martin Luther King, what is your dream? Oh, wow. Um, well, you know, I do think it's interesting that we are in the space of honoring Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, legacy um, at the same time that we're also having this um, issue with voting rights because the number one thing that Martin Luther King, one of the number one things that Martin Luther King Jr. fought for was the right to vote. And for all of the things that were impeding people from voting, um, to take those away. And literally, we're, in, we're, we're walking it backwards to the 1960s right now. And so uh, the Martin Luther King, um, you know, foundation, the daughters and, you know, the family have said, please don't celebrate my father and honor him. Please don't put his quotes up about unity and love if you don't fully understand what he was after, which was the right to, for all people to flourish. And he spoke very, very strongly against things, but those aren't the quotes that people hear. And so I think, um, I, I think Martin Luther King Jr. and Mother Teresa, both of them, are great examples of people that were rooted in their faith. And so their faith compelled them to say hard things. Mm -hmm. And yet their faith also empowered them to remain um, at peace with themselves and with the reality that those things might not change in their lifetime. And so... Um, you know, even, even as, 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 uh, MLK Jr. spoke out against, uh, the, the, the issues that were happening, the uprisings that were happening, um, in Chicago and other places around, around our country, he still said, you know, riot is the voice of the unheard. And so if you don't want these things to happen, then you need to repent and change instead of staying silent in your pews and singing your songs, uh, paraphrase. But, um, I think his, his quote was that you're being, um, you're, you're, you're surrounded by the security of your stained glass windows, I think is what he said. Mm -hmm. So he actually said a lot of very um, strong things. Um, but then what he embodied was the, and I think what Mother Teresa embodied was the reality that, that it will be a long, um, a long, long journey towards uh, the work of justice and the reality of, of what we see in revelation. And so um yeah, I think my hope forward, my dream is that honestly, like the things that I pray for every day is like, God, just help us as a church to be humble and repentant. Like whatever you want to do in this generation and in, in not just in our country, but around the world, whatever you want to do, do it, do it through us, change our hearts, soften our hearts. Um, let the, the majority world church uh, the global church lead us in this. We, we don't have the answers. We messed it up actually. Um, and so since we're only 10% of the global church, why would we in the West be asking to be at the center and in the front of this thing? Um, humble us, let us let, help us to let go of power. Um, and so I think when we repent, when we let go of power, when we confess our fears, when we're driven by courage and hope, I think we invite a collective movement towards liberation that centers the marginalized, that centers those who have been silenced, that rightly places um, our brothers, our brothers and sisters in India and in Africa um, and in South America and in, in Latin America at the center of the movement of the church. Um, and so that's my dream. I, I, I really have a dream for um, authors, podcasters, writers, speakers, white Western folks, educated folks to just be quiet for like you know, a century at least, maybe. Like, just be <laughs> quiet. Um, the world has already followed you since the 1500s. Um, it would be okay if we if we just participated but didn't lead. Um, so that's my hope. My hope is freedom through centering those on the margin. Wow. Oof. As you were speaking, even I'm gonna be honest. I have. I'm wearing glasses right now. Uh, shades. They're dark. 
but a little tear rolled down my cheeks. Okay? This was powerful. Um, and there's something in this. I know, I know it's it's kind of hard to to come to grasp what's going on and the tension and you know, calling people this or calling people that. I personally I, I don't like the word, you know, to say somebody is white. You know, like, oh, you're the white, the white church or the white this or the white that. Um, but that's my personal perspective because I feel like that's how that's how people take it. You know, people people see it that way, and I don't know. I don't know if I can do enough to change that. But um, okay, give me a second right here because I lost my screen. <laughs> Let me see. Show all windows. See, I got so intense that I pushed down my arm, and then the screen went out. I can't oh, find no. it. <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay, so we're back. Um, and this is, I, there's tension. There's tension in the, when these topics, but even, you know, like I say, I want to talk about these topics because I want to give a voice to people, even my own voice. You know, I'm an immigrant. I'm from Mexico. Uh, I already said, you know, things about me. And you already said about, you know, you want to see the voices of podcasters and authors coming out of Latin America and all these places. Um, and like a part of me, I feel like I don't I don't want to silence people just you know, because. But but also there's a there's a tension in. Yes, our voices need to be heard um, or at least we should listen to one another more. And there is this sense of maybe we have we haven't lamented as a as a as a as a glo I was going to say maybe as a global community but maybe it's as a nation or there's something in that you know cuz I come from Mexico and in a sense I feel like wow when I came to the US it's like the the whole thing about you know black or white is a big deal here when I was in Mexico it, it, I didn't really care about it and I like, oh, okay yeah there's black and white in America you know but here's like oh yeah I'm white oh you're black and I feel like that that even that statement you're black you're white hurts us even more but at the same time that's that's the reality because it's based on how this this nation was formed you know and I think there's a place for ethnicities and there's a place for you know being proud of of the community that you kind of grew up in or you belong to you know but also it creates all kinds of confusion <laughs> like some people here you know they take mexican as okay mexican is almost like a race i'm like yeah. mexico well, is and, not and a race <laughs> and we're confusing too because we're both an ethnicity and and and, and uh, multiple racial groups because i think you're right i think what we need to do too is and we don't have probably time to get into the podcast but i could rec recommend a couple books um yes that help with that. But I think one thing is for us to distinguish and understand that it, ethnicity is, is in scripture and it understands that we all come from different cultures. Some of us are communal. Some of us are individual. Some of us have hierarchy. Some of us have egalitarian. There's all these cultural, some of us are time oriented. Some of us ahorita it means like, you know, tomorrow uh, there's, there, there's like, <laughs> that'd be me. It, that's one. Um, so there's, there's cultural realities, but there's also socio social racial realities. My, I have a son who is a white Latino and I have a son who is black. And the reality is they do not experience the same things in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and they will not experience the same things in our neighborhood. So um, that is looking at our history and our theology around um, really uh, structures of oppression. And so Christopher Columbus did not discover the Americas Christopher Columbus came and colonized the Americas. Um, in most of our Latin American countries, like Argentina, for example, there's not a lot of thriving indigenous communities that are public because they have a similar history that the U.S. has, mm. where we basically enacted genocide on Native Americans in our country. We can't just say, oh, let's just be people and move forward because that genocide affected generations uh, of people and it and it enacted a, a cycle of poverty within that community. So um, we we hold space to say we have histories that are meaningful. You can have, um, my mom's from Colombia, you could have a Colom Colombiana that looks like me, you could have an Afro-Colombiana, you could have uh, a, a Colombiana that's more indigenous, and we will experience different realities both mm. in Colombia and in the U.S. because of the color of our skin. That's just true. Um, there's anti-blackness in Latin America. It's there. 
um, for the jobs you can get, for the places you can live. And so until we as Christians say, wow, we participate, we, we allow this kind of thing to, 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 to go in, um, both of those things have to be addressed. Our cultural beauty, our cultural gifts, and our social reality that we live in. Because my neighbor doesn't experience the same thing I do because of the way they look. And that's just a reality. So I think a book like The Color of Compromise by Jamar Tisby would be great to look at that as far as US history. There are incredible books written about Latin American racial history that I think are really good as well. Um, and so I can give them to you for the show notes. But yeah, I, I mean, I think we should ask some questions and not be afraid. It's okay. We're we're the people that carry grace, don't we? I mean, we preach grace. So mm-hmm. if we have historically or currently wronged other people, then we should be the first people to say in God's presence um, and through God's grace, we are set free um, to find a new way forward, not to pretend that the past didn't happen. Mm. Wow. So good. Okay. So this is your chance on the show to go from blasphemous. Wait, here's my mic. I'm, I'm just pushing things away here. Um, I'm so excited to go from blasphemous to divine. And what that means is that you're going to tell me from your own vantage point in our culture and society today, what is the most blasphemous idea out there, whether in the church, whether in activism, whatever, just what is the most blasphemous idea you can think of? The most blasphemous idea I can think of is um, that was all in the past. Why can't we just move forward? Ooh, that was all es- in the past. Especially because the number one command that God gives to his people in the entire Old Testament is to remember and to never forget. Oof. Ah, so good. Okay. Um, next one is skeptical. What are you skeptical of in this realm of activism? and justice. Mm, okay. I'm skeptical of people that think they can do it in their own strength Ugh. because they think they're smart enough or educated enough or resourced enough. And I really believe that you need the power of the Holy Spirit um, to fight, you know, 400 years of evil. Wow. <laughs> that was so good. Love it. Okay. Um, tell me something inspired in this realm of activism. Okay. This is, these are good. Okay. I like this nice. um, in, inspiration. Oh my gosh. Immigrant churches in rural and urban communities, loving their neighbor in practical ways is so inspiring. Um, movements um, of, of advocacy and um, justice in places like Honduras um, through organizations that are really holding people accountable to the way that they care for um, their citizens. Yeah. So inspiring. Love it. Okay. Uh, fourth one is holy. Tell me something holy in this realm of activism. God's presence in the in the midst of it. Um, I think uh, I I don't think I'll see a lot of change in my lifetime. Honestly, mm. I might ninety years. It's not you know. Let's say I live to ninety, um, but I think knowing and accepting God's presence from generation to generation, uh, that God is completely other and still manages to be present with us. Oof. Wow. So good. Okay. And the last one is divine. Tell me something that's divine in this realm. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, so many things about that word. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, the image that we're given in Revelation 21 that says that um, in the end, when God is completed all things, that there will be no more tears, no more pain, uh, no more injustice, um, and that um, God will be our God and that we will be God's people. Um And then God says, I am making all things new. So I think that is the imagination we have to hold. Sandra, wow, that's so good.
All right, my friends. Well, that was an amazing, amazing talk with our friend Sandra Maria Van Opstal. Sandra, where can people find more about the work that you're doing, your activism, your books, um, your thoughts, your ideas, even your uh, coaching, right? Yeah, well, you guys can find me um, at, at chasingjustice.com um, or on Instagram at Chasing Justice underscore. That's where our community is curating resources, having dialogues, and um, giving coaching for people that are on this journey. Love it. Thank you so much. See you on the next one. And my friends, if you want to check out ChristianPodcast.com, we have show notes, we have merchandise, we have in depth of our episodes. So go check it out, ChristianPodcast.com. There's my story right there. You can get to know me. A little more. We'll see you guys on the next one.